You have heard of the giant beaver, but what you know about the species, casteroids may not be true. The real evidence lies in their skull and bone chemistry, which completely contradicts the idea of a giant dam building creature. Fossil analysis shows their incisors were not sharp enough to fell trees and chemical signatures in their bones confirm they did not eat wood. Instead, these features reveal a different survival strategy, one that completely challenges the popular image of a log piling giant from the Ice Age. And this is where the illusion of a mega beaver begins to unravel. Picture the Ice Age wetlands for a moment. It is tempting to imagine enormous rodents the size of small bears chomping through towering trees and piling logs into giant dams that could block rivers. That image has been repeated in illustrations and museum displays for more than one century, a familiar animal simply scaled up. The problem is it oversimplifies what Castroids really was. Its body size alone does not prove it behaved like a mega version of today's beaver. The clearest evidence comes from the skull. Modern beavers, Castor canadensis, have long wedge-shaped skulls designed for cutting wood with precision. Castoroids, on the other hand, had a skull that was shorter and deeper than that of Castor canadensis, altering muscle attachments and bite angle. This compact design points to a very different set, a different set of forces at work when it bit into something. It was not a head built for soaring through lumber day after day. Teeth provide the next big clue. Modern beaver incisors are sharp chisels. Their enamel layer is concentrated on the front surface, so each bite keeps the cutting edge sharp as softer dentin behind wears away. They are self-maintaining blades, perfect wood cutting tools. Castoroids did not have this system. Its incisors were thick, slightly curved and covered in ridges. They were blunt gouge like tools, not chisels. That contrast alone suggests Castoroids handled softer material rather than hardwood. Despite these differences, early researchers assumed giant beavers must have built giant dams. The reasoning was simple. They looked like beavers, so they must have acted like them. Some early artwork even showed towering log works in Ice Age rivers. But there is a problem. No confirmed Pleistocene era dams or lodges attributable to Castoroids have been documented. We do not see sharpened logs with the right bite marks. We do not see preserved piles of timbers matching their tooth size or angle. For an animal that ranged across a continent, one would expect at least one dam site yet the record stays silent. When skeletons are compared side by side, the differences between castoroids and modern beavers begin to outweigh the similarities. The giant beaver carried a heavy frame, giving it strength and stability in the water, but its jaw mechanics limited what its teeth could tackle. Fossilized wear patterns show grinding and scraping along the teeth patterns more consistent with pliable plants than with tree trunks. That evidence matched with the unusual ridged anatomy of the incisors makes the old woodcutting narrative difficult to support. Together, these clues rewrite the picture. Instead of giant lumberjacks gnawing through forests, we see an animal shaped by a different set of needs. Its teeth were not sharpened chisels for carpentry, but tools built for another job entirely. Yet the question remains, if they were not cutting down trees, what were those massive teeth actually used for? The trail to the answer lies not in wood at all, but in a subtler kind of fossil chemical signatures preserved in the very bones of castoroids. This is the section where the science settles the debate. The massive front teeth of castoroids are more than just a striking feature. They are the clearest evidence of what this animal really did in its environment. The incisors are large, curved forward and lined with ridges measuring up to six inches long. At first glance, they seem like oversized versions of the sharp chisels you see in modern beavers. That assumption led researchers for decades to picture castoroids knocking down timber. But when you look closely at how those teeth are built, the design tells a different story. Modern beavers rely on sharpness. Their orange teeth sharpen themselves as softer dentin in the back wears away, leaving a cutting edge that slices cleanly through wood. Castoroids lacked that adaptation. It's enamel wrapped more fully around the tooth producing ridged surfaces and blunt curved tips, where patterns are equally telling. On fossil specimens, they do not show the fine, narrow polish of repeated cutting. Instead, they show broad scraping and grinding surfaces. In mechanical terms, these giant incisors worked more like heavy pry bars than like delicate blades. They were tools that could crush and tear, but not chisels designed to carve through hardwood. 
That mismatch alone suggests a diet very different from what the myth of the mega dam builder requires. If anatomy hints at what was really happening, chemical evidence drives the conclusion home. Collagen preserved in bones retains carbon and nitrogen isotopes that record diet in life. A comprehensive study published in 2019 tested 11 individual castoroids across different regions of North America. Researchers compared those isotope values against modern plant baselines and ran them through a statistical mixing model. The signal could not have been clearer. The isotope results cluster with submerged aquatic plants, not terrestrial browse. That means pond weeds, lilies, cattails, and other macrophytes, living plants rooted in lakes and wetlands were the dominant food source. This is not a minor adjustment to the story. If castoroids had relied heavily on bark and woody material, the isotope fingerprints would look more like those of forest feeding browsers, such as deer. Instead, every sampled individual lined up with aquatic diets, regardless of where it lived. The agreement across regions shows the finding was not an odd local habit. It was the consistent strategy of the species. When you place anatomy beside chemistry, they reinforce one another. The ridged, blunt teeth look perfect for gripping and shredding pliable stalks. The wear marks match scraping and tearing rather than slicing wood. The isotope chemistry confirms that the food was indeed aquatic vegetation and not trees. Together, these two lines of evidence close the case. Castroids was not a lumberjack, it was a wetland grazer. Visualizing this in daily life helps the point land. Picture a giant beaver pushing its weight through thick beds of aquatic growth, wrenching up stalks of pond weed with those curved incisors, stripping bundles of cattail stems, chewing through spongy vegetation while swimming through shallow marshes. Instead of gnawed tree stumps and dams, the evidence points to mats of torn water plants and open passageways carved out by feeding. So the teeth were not giant axes, they were heavy duty tools for harvesting aquatic plants. That distinction does more than settle an old debate about diet. It changes how we think about the giant beaver's role in its ice age ecosystems. And it sets up the bigger question, if it was not building dams like modern beavers, what was it doing to shape its wetlands? When we look at living beavers, the defining image is an engineer. Small animals cut down trees, dragging branches into place and stacking mud until a dam stretches across a stream. The result is a pond, a lodge, and an entire ecosystem reshaped by those actions. They do not just occupy an environment, they restructure it. That expectation was so strong that when giant beaver fossils were first uncovered, it seemed natural to assume bigger animals must have built bigger dams. Twice the body size, four times the teeth, a range spanning most of North America. Surely they must have left massive works across the Pleistocene landscape. Yet the evidence tells another story. There is no convincing sedimentological evidence of dams or lodges made by castroids. And when you combine its anatomy and its isotope-based diet, the conclusion follows they likely did not engineer waterways in the way modern caster species do. The shift in understanding begins with diet. Stable isotope analysis locked in ancient bone chemistry shows a reliance on aquatic macrophytes, not bark. The distinctive wear patterns on their teeth fit soft vegetation, not wood. That alone undercuts the picture of them chopping timber. And without trees falling, the material for dam construction disappears. Surveys of peat beds, lake edges, and river sediments reinforce this. Researchers have unearthed skeletons, seeds, and plant remains in the same deposits, but never the signature piles of cut logs that would reveal large-scale engineering. If castoroids had been reshaping waterways at the scale of modern beavers, the imprint should be clear. The lack of those traces is its own answer. Biology supports the same conclusion. Endocasts of castoroid skulls suggest a relatively smaller, smoother brain case compared to its living relatives. That may point to reduced capacity for complex coordinated construction behaviors. It does not provide definitive proof on its own, but alongside the dietary and mechanical evidence, it strengthens the case that these animals did not have the behavioral repertoire necessary for dam engineering. So if they were not architects, what role did they play in their ecosystems? Evidence points to something closer to a gardener than an engineer. By feeding heavily on submerged and floating macrophyte plants such as pondweed water lilies and cattails, the giant beaver acted as a regulator of aquatic environments. In dense mats, these plants can choke wetlands, blocking light, penetration, decreasing, dissolved oxygen, and creating stagnant conditions that drive out fish, invertebrates, and birds. By consuming large amounts of vegetation, castoroids would have kept shallow waterways open, reduced excessive plant mats, and promoted aquatic biodiversity. 
That effect was not small. Each bike cleared pockets through swamps and marshes, making space for light and flow. Across large populations, those daily foraging routines reshaped the balance of wetlands. Much as grazing mammals on land keep grasslands from collapsing into thickets, the giant beaver's feeding pressure prevented wetlands from being strangled by unchecked plant growth. It was constant maintenance, not construction, but it mattered immensely. You can capture the difference in one line. Modern beavers are engineers that build dams. Casteroids were gardeners that removed biomass and kept channels open. One rewrites the course of streams, the other manages the vegetation within them. Both shaped ecosystems, but by very different means. And in its gardener's role, casteroids flourished. Glacial lakes, swamps and wetlands offered them abundant food, and in turn, they helped those environments remain productive. Their specialization locked them into this cycle. Wetlands supplied their diet and their foraging kept those wetlands healthy. But specialization always carries a hidden cost. That ecological niche worked only as long as aquatic habitats remained widespread. That specialism helped while wetlands were abundant, but specialization carries risk. What happened when the wetlands disappeared? For thousands of years, casteroids occupied an immense range across North America from the cold edges of Alaska down through the wetlands of Florida. Fossil evidence places them in rivers, ponds, and shallow lakes across nearly the whole continent. On the surface, this wide distribution might suggest resilience, but their true survival strategy contained a critical weakness. They were widespread yet ecologically narrow, thriving only where plant-filled wetlands provided the habitat and aquatic vegetation they depended on. During the height of the Ice Age, those conditions were abundant. Glacial melt carved shallow basins, rivers spread laterally into swamps, and new wetlands burst with pondweed lilies and cattails. Across this mosaic of watery landscapes, the giant beaver flourished. That success became instability once the environment shifted. As the Pleistocene ended and global temperatures rose, glaciers that had sustained countless lakes and marshes retreated. Water levels dropped rivers, cut deeper channels instead of spilling into floodplains, and sprawling wetlands gave way to narrower systems. Reduction in wetland extent and productivity would have sharply cut available food resources, pushing specialized feeders like casteroids toward population collapse. The sheer size of the giant beaver meant huge daily energy needs, yet its specialized diet offered almost no flexibility. The very teeth and jaws that supported aquatic grazing now limited adaptation when plant density fell and habitats were fragmented. This lack of flexibility contrasts with that of other large herbivores. Deer could browse shrubs, bison could graze both grasses and sedges. Casteroids lacked those options. It did not carry the specialized cutting teeth of modern beavers capable of gnawing wood and its enamel ridges were unsuited to bark. Ecological rigidity became the bottleneck. As wetlands disappeared, alternative diets were not possible. The gardener's toolkit worked only in environments thick with aquatic vegetation. Once those systems broke down, a collapse in numbers followed naturally. Extinction usually cannot be explained by a single factor, and Castroids fits that broader pattern. Its decline was likely a mix of climate-driven wetland loss, primary dependence on aquatic plants, potential competition from modern beavers and other semi-aquatic rodents and limited behavioral flexibility. The combination created pressure from several directions at once. Environmental change, reduced food supply, niche overlap may have increased and no behavioral shift could compensate. Large specialized animals rarely weather such converging stresses. The question of human involvement has long hovered over the story. Casteroids fossils appear widely across North America. Radiocarbon and other dates place their disappearance near the end of the Pleistocene. The youngest reliably dated specimens in some studies fall around 10,000 to 11,000 years before present, meaning they overlapped in time with early human groups in parts of Eastern North America, though there is no zoo archeological evidence for widespread hunting. Bones of casteroids show no consistent butchery marks and no archeological kill sites confirm systematic exploitation. Overlap occurred, but extinction does not tie cleanly to human activity. The broader picture matches that of many Ice Age giants. Megafauna over 100 kilograms disappeared across continents in the same late Pleistocene window. Mammoths ground sloths and giant bison all fell during that ecological turnover. Casteroids fits within the same wave, undone less by direct human pressure than by shifts in environments that had once supported very large, highly specialized animals. The loss of the giant beaver is not best read as the collapse of a great dam builder. 
It had never been an engineer that cut wood. It was a grazer tethered to wetlands, undone by dependence on habitats that were shrinking beyond recovery. Their presence across the continent did not mean resilience. Wide ranges offer no safety if every location depends on the same fragile condition. They were widespread yet ecologically narrow when the wetlands went, there was nowhere left for them to adapt to. In this sense, Castroid stands as an example of specialization's double edge. Adaptations that worked perfectly in one set of conditions became a trap when those conditions faded away. The story is not about defeat by predators or weakness against rivals. It is about an animal that thrived in a particular niche until change arrived too quickly. And from that perspective, the legacy of this giant rodent becomes a warning about the cost of inflexibility and the risks built into even the most successful evolutionary strategies. Castoroides was not the giant lumberjack we often imagine. It was a specialized aquatic plant eater relying on wetlands for survival. Its extinction was not a failure of strength, but a lack of flexibility to adapt when its habitat began to change.